Hello, my name is Dylan, I'm a physicist, and today I thought we could try a new style of video, one in which we look at Stephen Hawking's grades. And we're also going to go over some of his discoveries, and I as a physicist can try and explain some of the complexities behind some of his ideas. Now, if you've come across Tibby's channel, you might realize that I'm still borrowing this idea from her channel, as she has done a couple of similar videos about Einstein's and Tesla's grades. But anyway, go check out her channel because it's awesome. If you've seen The Theory of Everything, which is a movie about Stephen Hawking's life, then you might know a couple things that I'm going to talk about. But most of the stuff I'm going to talk about wasn't in the movie, so stick around. If you haven't seen that movie and you are now here with me because you clicked on this video, you need to go watch it because you're going to love it. It is a wonderful movie. Now, Stephen Hawking is one of the most famous geniuses of our age. But was he always a genius? In this video, we're going to look at his education. Now, I hope this video gives everyone some inspiration, especially if you don't think you are capable of studying something like physics or math, because trust me, you are. You can learn anything you want to. I'm not going to share too many of my opinions on the matter, so let me just share an Einsteinian quote. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So Hawking is a bit of a hero for everyone, but especially the physicists. Some of the ideas he gave us are brilliant, some not so brilliant, like when he wagered $100 that we wouldn't discover the Higgs boson at the LHC, or when he wagered a year subscription to Penthouse against Kip Thorne, a Nobel laureate now, that Cygnus X1 wasn't a black hole. He also still has an ongoing wager that naked singularities can't exist. Now, a naked singularity is just a singularity that's exposed to space-time. Most singularities are hidden by event horizons. Um, so I think he could be wrong about that one too, because if quantum gravity is correct, or at least on the right track, then they really might be possible. Anyway, let's not go down too much of a tangent. The guy was wrong sometimes, but some of the science he gave us is genius. Like, for instance, the entropy of a black hole, or Hawking radiation. Now, I'll explain a lot of that in more detail later in the video, so make sure you stick around for that. So we're almost at Hawking's grades, but first, I think it's really interesting to know that he actually couldn't read, according to himself, until he'd completed about eight rotations around the sun. Now, that I, I didn't really know what that meant. I had to look up what the typical age that children are able to read, and it's actually about six to seven years old. Uh, some can even read by four to five. And he also notes in his autobiography that his sister, Philippa, was actually able to read by the age of four. But he also noted that she was definitely brighter than him. So I guess he was a bit of a late bloomer. All right, high school. So according to himself, he was unexceptional. He was never further than halfway up his class. He was also very untidy, and his handwriting was the despair of his teachers. I can definitely relate to those last two. My handwriting is shocking. It is awful, like an ape could probably write neater than me. And I'm also pretty untidy. But that seems to be a pretty recurrent problem amongst some notable physicists. But I think my bad handwriting and my untidiness simply comes down to my lazy nature. I never really saw any need to improve. People could read it. So what's the point in wasting time and improving something that is already doing its job? And if I was a betting man, I would bet like Stephen Hawking, that Stephen Hawking probably shared that opinion. His classmates also gave him the nickname Einstein, so clearly the people around him saw a bit more than the teachers. Um, someone at this time also bet him a bag of lollies that he would never amount to anything. So I wonder if he ever got those lollies. So why was he so unexceptional at school? I don't know the answer to that, but I can hazard a guess. I'm sure it has a little bit to do with him being humble. But I'm also sure there's some truth to it. Maybe he never saw any need to work particularly hard. He also only revealed a lot of this in his 70s. So looking back at 50 year old memories, I'm sure he's just remembering the awful marks and not the exceptional ones, being the humble person that he is. So whilst he noted that he was never further than halfway up his class in his autobiography, he also noted that it was a fairly bright bunch. Now, I did my research on his school, St. Albans, and you do have to pass an entrance exam to get into the school. So it's already a pretty bright bunch of kids. 
Then the classes are sorted by ability in at least three classes per subject. So he was halfway up the top stream. That already puts him in the top one six of kids in his year. So that's hardly mediocre as he puts it. Another possible reason for his unexceptional performance at this school is the fact that this school puts a lot of emphasis on sporting achievement. They regard it as just as important as academics. So Hawking not being very interested in sport and physical education, I'm sure this probably brought his overall grade down a lot. So his grades in physics and math might have been brilliant. I'm sure he didn't feel a lot of pressure either. Apparently he used to spend a lot of time doing non-academic things like creating overly complex board games and making uh, early forms of computers with his teachers. Okay, so moving on to his university undergraduate days in physics. And the first thing to note here is that he actually won a scholarship to Oxford at the age of 17. Um, so he must have been pretty brilliant by that time because average kids don't win something like that. For his year, there were actually two other kids who also got into Oxford, um, but they were both a year older than him. Something that's common knowledge amongst physicists is that he apparently averaged about an hour a day of study during his undergraduate physics degree. Um, and if you've done a degree in physics, which I have, then you'd understand that that's quite a feat. Uh, he does say that he isn't proud of this though in his autobiography. So he did earn first class honours from Oxford. And if you don't know what that means, it essentially means he averaged higher than 80%, at least in today's standards. And there's quite a story behind this. So apparently he was right on the edge between second class honours and first class honours. Um, and he had to go to this Viva where his professors were going to decide which level he got. Um, and apparently... Hawking said to them, if you give me a first class honours, I will leave and go to Cambridge. But if you give me second class, I will stay here at Oxford. And because apparently the professors thought he was quite lazy and they didn't really want him around, they gave him the first class. And this is apparently a true story. In his autobiography, he does mention that he was a really lazy student. But he also mentions that a lot of his fellow physics students also shared similar attitudes. Uh, boredom and feeling like nothing was really worth making an effort for. And I can certainly relate to that when I look back at my undergraduate days and a lot of the students I was around, the physics students, yeah, only some of them shared that sort of attitude. So I think his statements in his autobiography about him being an average student are probably from a very early age um, and I think they're a little overstated. So that's it for his education grades. There is his PhD, but I'm thinking I might make a separate video where I run through it with you and explain some of it to you for all the people that don't really know too much physics or math because it is quite heavy in those areas. In his autobiography, it wasn't until his doctors told him that he only had a few years left to live that he really decided to push his mind to its limits um, in the short time that he had left, which resulted in a period of enormous productivity and some of his early breakthroughs. He said, when faced with the possibility of an early death, it makes you realize that life is worth living and there's lots of things you want to do. So before we get into his science, I hope his early days gives you some belief in yourself. It seems Hawking wasn't born a genius. Rather, his genius was sculpted particularly, and it seems purely by his curiosity. So if you're a curious individual, you might have all you need to become a Hawking level intellect. So have some belief in yourself and dream big. Um, another example of what I'm preaching is Einstein's story, but we'll save that for another story in space time. So back to Hawking science, let's go over it in a bit more detail, but only a little bit. And like Hawking used to say, every equation halves the viewership. So I'm not gonna show you any equations, we're just gonna talk about it. So one of his earliest ideas was that the Big Bang might have been like the collapse of a black hole in reverse. He and Roger Penrose in the 1970s uh, worked out some of the mathematics of this idea and put out a paper that suggested that the universe must have started from a singularity an infinitely dense point in space. 
he another one of his early ideas was that black holes can only ever grow in size they can never decrease this may appear glaringly evident since nothing that gets close can get away not even light as i'm sure a lot of you have heard um, and this is sounds quite similar to entropy which if you've watched my previous video you'll know all about it and how entropy can only ever increase it can never decrease so a black hole's mass decides its size which is measured by the radius of the event horizon, the point past which nothing can escape. So this event horizon will inevitably crawl outwards like a balloon being blown up. But he went even further. He showed that a black hole could never be split up into smaller things, not even via the collision of two black holes. Then he made another intuitive leap. He argued that the event horizon's ever-expanding surface area was analogous to another quantity in physics, that of which can only ever grow as well. And that quantity is entropy, which is a measure of the disorder of a system. And like I just said, I go over this a lot in my previous video. So if you want to know all about entropy, I highly suggest going and checking out that video. But just quickly, atoms say stacked together inside a crystal in a repeating nature, they have low entropy, whereas atoms in a gas that are moving around randomly have high entropy. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, the, the total entropy of the universe always increases. So in other words, uh, the universe's disorder is always increasing and it's di increasing more as the universe gets older. So Hawking pointed out that these two rules of nature the ever-increasing entropy of the universe and the ever-increasing surface area of a black hole were oddly similar. So around 1970, just after Hawking put forth this result, a young physicist named uh, Jacob Bekenstein suggested that maybe this wasn't an analogy and maybe that the surface area of a black hole's event horizon really was a measure of the black hole's total entropy. But that seemed wrong. If an object has entropy, it must have temperature. And if an object has temperature, it must radiate energy. But the whole point of a black hole was that nothing gets out. So at the time, physicists didn't believe this. They thought it made no sense, including Hawking. Um, and Bekenstein himself said that a black hole's temperature couldn't be real because it leads to a paradox. So Hawking actually set out to prove Bekenstein wrong, but in attempting to do so, he realized that he was basically correct. Um, and in order to show this, he had to bring together two areas of physics that had never been brought together before, quantum theory and general relativity. So quantum theory is what describes the very small. It's our best theory to describe atoms, whereas general relativity describes matter on the cosmic scale describes the large scale phenomena we see in the universe, like galaxies and stars. The two theories seem fundamentally incompatible. General relativity assumes that space is smooth and continuous, like a flat sheet, whereas quantum theory insists that the world and everything in it is grainy on the smaller scales, parceled into discrete lumps. Physicists have been trying to bring together these two great theories of physics for a long time. Um, because doing so might yield something like the theory of everything. And Stephen Hawking made it known that he was trying to do such for a very long time as well. Um, but he doesn't pretend to acknowledge that he's an, a quantum analysis of black holes is doing such. It's more like a patchwork of the two theories. So according to quantum theory, Empty space is not actually all that empty. You see, you have these particles popping in and out of existence constantly, spontaneously and randomly. So they pop into existence, these pairs of particles, one matter, one antimatter. So one has positive energy and one has negative energy. So overall, no new energy is being created. And then they quickly annihilate each other so quickly that they can't be directly detected. And they can be detected indirectly. I'm not going to talk about that. But for this reason, they are called virtual particles. So where these particles are coming from invokes quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, you have these fields that permeate all of space. Um, and they're always there. And they always have some energy. And when there's a dumping of energy into a particular point in that field, you get this 
wavy little particle of energy. So anyway, back to Hawking. So Hawking had essentially proved himself wrong. Remember how I said he's, one of his first ideas was that black holes can only ever grow? Well, according to this, if this phenomena happens on the border of the event horizon, these virtual particles can be upgraded to real. And one, because it pops into existence on this border of the event horizon, one beyond the border, that one falls into the black hole and the one outside falls into the universe. So if the negative energy one falls into the black hole, it essentially decreases the mass of the black hole. And the one that falls into the universe is actually what we call Hawking radiation. And that also explains how black holes evaporate by that negative energy particle falling into the black hole that annihilates with a positive piece of energy inside the black hole, decreasing its mass. Then in 1971, Hawking gave us another awesome idea that during the Big Bang, some lumps of matter could have collapsed into miniature sized black holes that would weigh about a billion tons. Now that might sound like a lot, but that's tiny compared to the Earth. So these black holes would be smaller than the size of an atom. Because a black hole's temperature increases as its event horizon surface area gets smaller, these things would be really hot. As Hawking said, they'd be a white hot. So these little things would fizz with Hawking radiation until eventually it disappeared. But these things would not go quietly. As they get smaller, they get hotter until eventually it would explode with the energy of about a million one megaton hydrogen bombs. Hawking outlined his theory of Hawking radiation and primordial mini black holes in 1974. And it was pretty shocking and controversial at the time. But many physicists today believe Hawking radiation is a real thing. And some believe that primordial black holes might be real and some don't. So far, nobody has detected this radiation though. But that's not very surprising because for normal sized black holes, their temperature is just above zero Kelvin. So the amount of Hawking radiation they'd be letting off is absolutely tiny. Seven years later, Hawking announced another awesome idea that has to do with the implications of a disappearing black hole. And that's that they destroy information. When particles or light rays cross the event horizon, they fall into the black hole and are stuck there forever. Any such entity can be said to hold information such as its mass and position. So when they fall into the black hole, this information is also locked inside the black hole. So what then happens after the black hole has evaporated? Is the information destroyed? So there are two possibilities of what's going on here. One, that this information that is lost is actually being encoded into the Hawking radiation that's emitted from the black hole, or that this information really is destroyed. Um, and Hawking was arguing that it really is destroyed and it's gone forever. Uh, a notable physicist, American physicist Leonard Susskind, actually got into a massive debate about this with Hawking. And he suggested that no, it isn't lost. Um, he thought it would be pretty disturbing if information really was being destroyed. We like to imagine that causes come before their effects, not the other way around. In principle, generally not in practice, we could reconstruct from looking at a particle's information, its history throughout the universe. But that reconstruction from effects to cause becomes impossible if that information is truly being destroyed in black holes. And if it truly is being destroyed, the whole notion of cause and effect begins to look a bit shaky. So this debate between Susskind and Hawking raged on for a couple of decades, and Hawking wagered another bet, as he had done many times, with a guy called John Preskill, that information was indeed lost. Um, and it wasn't until 2004 that Hawking conceded, um, gave Preskill his encyclopedia, and announced that Susskind was right. So when he announced that he was conceding, he also qualified his statement suggesting that this information that is released back to the universe is in a corrupted form that is virtually unreadable. And then in the 1980s, he actually tried to describe the Big Bang in quantum mechanical terms, but it does so in such general terms, many physicists think it's pretty meaningless. 
One thing the equation does suggest though is that it is meaningless to ask questions about the origin of the universe because when the universe was less than a billionth of a yoctometer across, time and space, well quantum theory implies that time and space, the boundaries between such, were very fuzzy. This means that the universe did not have any boundaries in space or time, even though it was still self-contained. So the very idea of an origin in time vanishes. Um, so this is the idea he actually presented in his book, um, A Brief History in Time. So that's enough of hawking science. But before I end the video, I thought I could talk a little bit about the end of his life. So he did die in 2018 at the age of 76. Um, he was diagnosed with ALS when he was 21 years old and only given a few years to live. So the fact that he's lived such a long and incredible life is as much as a scientific marvel as some of the theories and discoveries it yielded. Walking right to the end that was still encouraging people to be curious and to try and make sense out of the world and to try and understand why the universe exists and to never give up. And as he said, it's important that you don't give up. There's something everyone can do and succeed at and it matters that you don't give up. And lastly, another brilliant thing about Stephen Hawking was his sense of humor. He was always trying to make things funny, always trying to make people laugh and see the bright side and funny side of life. And my favorite quote of his, um, I'll, I'll end this video with it. And it's, life would be tragic if it weren't funny. I'll see you next time, guys.